Happy New Year, everybody. Welcome to 2024. I'm Greg Sweeney, and welcome to the conference call. In the next 10 to 15 minutes, we're going to cover a few topics. One of them is a wrap up, a quick wrap up of 2023, a little inflation discussion, some talk about the Federal Reserve and the direction of interest rates, the consumer, a brief outlook for 2024, and portfolio positioning for the coming 12 to 18 months or so. So with that, I'd like to start on a quick review of 2023. Uh, if we look, if we think back a year ago, we had just finished 2022 uh, losses somewhere in the neighborhood of 20% on most uh, major stock market indexes, and the prospect and outlook for 2023 was not very good. Right? One of the things that happens in terms of forecasts is forecasts tend to be an extension of the recent past. And with 2022 being so poor, the outlook for 2023 wasn't that great. Of course, we know that to be quite different now. And some of some uh, unique things happened in 2023 as well. And one of them we're looking at on the screen right now. You may have heard some financial news stories about the Magnificent Seven. And when those news stories refer to the Magnificent Seven, what they're talking about is the seven largest companies in the S&P 500. And those companies now make up about 28% of the index, with the other 493 companies making up about 72% of the index. Those co these companies that we're looking at on the screen right now, the Magnificent Seven, accounted for about two thirds of the returns of the S&P 500 this year, whereas the other 493 only accounted for one third. So we have a what's called a top weighted index. And then these are the seven companies that are that are dominating that that uh, index right now. Now the concern, not the concern, concerns the wrong word, but in, in 2024, with with 28 percent of this index being in just seven companies, if there's any hiccup, particularly in the tech space, as you see the names down below there, um, the, the index can come under more pressure. And you're going to see how we're positioned for this uh, in later slides. Yeah, you know, in terms of in terms of stock positioning. Real quick, interest rates uh, last year and and for about half of 2022, right, was the first time a lot of you as new investors have seen a real rate of return on bonds. A real rate of return is a return above the underlying inflation index. You know, for most of the decade prior to 2022, interest rates were somewhat close to zero. Uh, a lot of money that was being invested went into the stock market because there wasn't that much return available on bonds. But now this is the first time in about 15 years that we're seeing actual uh, returns available from the fixed income market. Uh, returns, of course, are very attractive at the short end of the yield curve. Matter of fact, the highest yields are at the short end of the, of the yield curve, uh, about five and a half, five and a quarter percent or so on, on short U.S. Treasury bills. And then as we look out further along the yield curve, uh, and yield curve is a, probably a bad decision today. It looks more like a yield plane, right? It's very flat uh, in terms of the yield between one year and all the way out to 30 years, being about 4% or so. One thing I want to touch on real quick on the interest rate curve is there's a lot of people that are keeping their money short because it's the best yield that they can get in the, in the marketplace. The challenge with that is what we call reinvestment risk. By the time the Federal Reserve starts to reduce rates, uh, we expect later on this year, uh, as the short rates start coming down, investors will have a harder time finding attractive yields further out. And so you, we'll talk a little bit about our fixed income pos positioning as well in terms of investing over the next 12 to 18 months. Inflation, of course, was the big topic over the last 18 months or so after peaking out at about 9%. The inflation rate right now is, is running just below 4%, you know, about 3.8% or so in the last check. There's a couple of different ways to measure inflation. Um, we're seeing the big contributors to inflation uh, on this graph right here, with the big ones being goods and services. So when you, talk, when you hear about um, services being an inflationary component, that's the green bar. Uh, transportation, the, the medium blue bar, and the other big ones, shelter, uh, are the three primary components contributing to the inflationary environment right now. Without improvement, uh, particularly in shelter, it'll be difficult for inflation to get back down to that 2% level. Matter of fact, we think inflation probably trends around 3% plus or minus a bit for the next you know, 12 to 18 months, 
we think 2% is a little bit of a reach. Um, and therefore, if, if 2% inflation is a reach, uh, it, it'll probably take a little bit longer for the Fed to reduce the short end of the yield curve than maybe a lot of market participants think it would take. Um, speaking of the Fed and, and reducing interest rates, uh, the Federal Reserve has come out and said, hey, look, we expect probably three cuts in 2024. The market is, <clears throat> is looking at six cuts in 2024. We think that might be a little optimistic in terms of what the Fed is projected in 2024. This kind of shows how that would look. Um, the, the market is expecting the first Fed rate cut to come somewhere around um, in uh, March. We think that the Fed is probably more accurate when they come right out and say, hey, it's may maybe May or June instead. Um, so it, it, we're, we're concerned that the market has gotten ahead of itself uh, looking for six cuts this year, particularly in the wake of what we think is inflation being a little sticky around 3% rather than 2%. We think the Fed is going to take their time in terms of reducing interest rates. The consumer, just a couple of slides on the consumer. We see uh, you know, a few spikes on the top graph here. Those were economic stimulus packages in the wake of the pandemic. Those have those have really gone away as a contributor contributor to personal income. It's mostly earned income now. It has been for the last 18 months or so. At the same time, and the uh, personal savings rate, which is basically uh, disposable personal income minus um, expenses, is is about 4.1 percent at the low end of the historical range, as you can see there. This is an indication that the consumer is coming under a little bit more pressure than maybe they had seen in the wake of the pandemic with the stimulus packages and things like that. Uh, we're also seeing some of that come through in terms of, you know, credit card delinquency rates starting to, to move up a little bit, just a little, not a lot. Same thing with uh, auto loans, delinquency rates starting to move up a little bit on, on uh, auto loans as well. Uh, not so much on mortgage loans, those are still pretty consistent. Um, but getting on with the consumer, you know, we used to have a very attractive job market where there was more jobs available than there were um, people uh, filing for unemployment. Uh, on average, there's more people available than there are jobs. Uh, right now, there are still more jobs than there are unemployed. And, you know, it's, it, they're not being filled for, for various reasons, you know, maybe qualifications, location. There's a number of reasons why job openings exist and and uh, people are there to fill them, but, they, but they're not being filled. Uh, the point of this slide is to indicate that the labor market is tightening up some raises have come back down to a little bit more average range, 3%, 4%, um, uh, you know, uh, a little bit higher than that for people in the first quartile uh, of, of income brackets and the highest income brackets you know, pay increases are, are back down to 2 to 3% or so, um, more consistent with the expected inflationary environment moving forward. So the, the uh, employment market is getting somewhat tighter. Uh, it's certainly not tight compared to historical averages, but not as attractive as it was 12 to 18 months ago. Quick outlook for 2024. Most of the risks that we see in the marketplace tend to be geopolitical, whether it's Russia, Ukraine, whether it's uh, Iran, Gaza, um, you, you know, and, and then does the Iran, Gaza expand to, I mean, um, excuse me, Israel, Gaza, and does Israel and Iran, does that war expand between, you know, instead of Israel, Gaza, does it go to Israel, Iran? Um, and if that does expand, of course, there are some cascading effects that occur. You know, if, if, if Iran gets involved in, in a war with Israel, it takes about 20% mm, of the oil supply out of the global oil markets, which suggests oil prices will go up, which could be inflationary. Um, other geopolitical risks are, are the prospect of China and their intent towards Taiwan. And and uh, I mentioned Ukraine, and and then and then frankly, it, one of the things that we'd lump in the geopolitical uh, risk would would potentially be the election this year, right? Um, uh, Seventy percent of respondents respondents to a survey don't want to be in a position to see Trump and Biden on the same ticket again. 
for example, right? And so um, it, it's, um, but it's not shaping up like that, right? It, it looks like it's going to be another Trump Biden ticket. And uh, even though 70% of those surveyed said they don't want either one of them um, as, as, a, as a ballot selection. Um, election years tend to see economic growth, right? I mean, if, for those of you wondering if the economy is going to slow down in 2024, election years tend to see some growth. Our best guess for economic growth this year is, is low growth, not explosive growth, but not, uh, but not a decline either. Um, why is that? Election spending tends to uh, inject money into the system. Of course, we still have deficit spending at the federal level. Um, and at the same time, we are investing in new technologies, particularly in the energy space with, uh, with renewables, uh, all suggest that the economy uh, probably sees growth in 2024. We think real interest rates remain in place. I have a real, uh, with, you know, um, with quotes around it. And just, just to remind myself to tell you what real rates are. Real rates are um, interest rates that are above the underlying inflation rate. So we expect the Federal Reserve to keep interest rates real, meaning that savers will earn an interest rate above the underlying inflation rate, and borrowers will pay an interest rate that's above the underlying inflation rate. Uh, we expect these to remain in place across the yield curve in 2024. So even if the Fed does start to reduce interest rates, we don't think they go below the inflation rate. We see it probably 50 basis points, which is a half a percent above the inflation rate at its tightest. Um, we think inflation might take a while to get down to 2%. I mentioned some of the reasons for that. You, you know, everything from the, the new supply chain disruptions we're seeing, uh, you, know, you know, with some of the attacks on cargo ships, um, um, spending on renewable energies, uh, deficit spending at the federal level, uh, consumers still taking on a little bit of debt. It's a slide I didn't have in there, but consumers still adding to debt. Um, uh, there's a lot of reasons that that suggest that inflation is going to take a while to get down to that two percent level. I I I would I doubt we see it in 2024. Maybe we get there in 2025, but uh, we are not looking to get much lower than you know three percent, give or take a little bit in 2024. Unfortunately, we expect volatility in the market to continue. Both equity markets and fixed income markets, real estate markets, of course, are a challenge because of where home mortgage rates are, although they've come down significantly from their peaks. Um, um, alternative type investments, uh, real estate, um, um, private equity, private credit, uh, we see volatility in all of those. It's just not as visible in some of them because private credit, private debt don't get priced as often as, as public markets do. But make no mistake about it, that same volatility is occurring behind the scenes, even though it's not priced in as often. And of course, something that regular re, uh, listeners on this, on this conference call have come to learn, we like to focus on the long term and staying the course. And a couple of slides that points that direction. Many of you have seen this before, um, staying the course. It's a slide that tells you if you remain fully invested for the last 20 years uh, at an investment rate of $10,000 invested 20 years ago, what you would have if you remain fully invested throughout the whole period, and then what you would have if you just tried to time the market and missed a few of the best days, right? Uh, it, by the time you missed the 30 best days, you're down to about what you would have invested over the last 20 years if you missed the best 40 and 50 days. You're, 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 you're at a loss, okay? It's very difficult when you consider how many days are in 20 years, right? What is that, uh, 7,000 days or so? Uh, fewer trading days, but um, if you're just talking missing the best 10, 20, 30, 40 days out of 7,000 days, um, um, that, that is a very difficult to time. So we are big advocates of staying the course. And another thing I wanted to touch with you, kind of wrapping things up here, is uh, not only not only uh, going back to 2022 and and what the outlook expected to be so poor, um, but uh, also discussion at the time of the 60/40 portfolio being dead. Uh, the 60/40 portfolio, as a quick reminder, is someone who puts 60% of their money in stock and 40% of their money in bonds. 2022 saw both stocks and bonds go down. And the 60-40 portfolio had a 16% loss in 2022. 
which had people talking about the death of the 6040 portfolio. Um, one of the things I would like to point out to you is if you look at the last 20 years of the 6040 portfolio, you'll notice that only three of those lines go negative. Okay, so this tends to be a fairly powerful allocation and investors have stayed invested even in the wake of the death of the 6040 portfolio. Um, they were rewarded with an 18% return in 2023. Again, big advocates were big advocates of focusing on the long term rather than trying to time the short term. And this is a slide that helps illustrate that along with the previous one that we have just seen. We'll be back with more of these calls in the next three months or so. Thank you for joining us today and I'm wishing you a great 2024. Bye now.